Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Giorgi Ligeti's Le Grand Macabre, which I saw at the Berliner Philharmonie. The conductor was Sir Simon Rattle, the production was done by Peter Sellers, the sets and costumes were done by Gies Lenars, and the musical assistant was Duncan Ward. I mainly knew Giorgi Ligeti and one of his works that I'm really familiar with, Le Grand Macabre, mostly through chance when I was a boy of about 12 years old as I got this really huge opera book for Christmas and I remember stumbling upon this particular opera and to this extent, this particular composer and especially a lot of the opera books I've been reading. Throughout time, I mainly knew the story but never heard of the music. It seemed quite interesting yet odd, yet quite fascinating all at the same time. And from what I've read from a lot of resources, and from what I've read from a lot of resources, the Swedish premiere of this particular opera starred such great singers like Elisabeth Söderström, Britt Marie Ahun, and Gunilla Wallen. And just by listening to this particular music, it's kind of interesting even though it's not really my tastes. But the way the the instrumentals really move together to create this type of erratic atmosphere is quite fascinating from beginning to end, which does show the theme of this great macabre and also what the perils of society has to offer and just a little bit of social commentary thrown in the mix. Basically, the four scenes feel like four short stories. The first scene deals with Necrozar, Pete the Pot, and the two lovers, Amanda and Amando known alternately as Clitoria and Spermando. While the lovers are discussing about how much they deeply and passionately love each other until the end of time, Pete the Pot and Necrozar are constantly bickering of what is going on in the world around them. When we go to the second scene, we deal with this astrologer by the name of Astradamors and his nagging wife Mescalina, who is just so unsatisfied of their marriage and she prays to the goddess Venus for pretty much a better sex life. The third scene deals with the child prince, Prince Gogo, as he gallivants around the palace, pretty much ordering his subordinates, and especially with Chief Kapopo coming in to spout in a lot of gibberish, and the population just wanting to impeach this particular child of a prince. Then when we go to the epilogue, all the characters are just on stage together and the lovers conclude with saying adieu to the real world. So from what I can tell from the story, there is just a lot of erratic moments, moments of social commentary, and without a doubt, just great amounts of surrealism where you really have to turn your brain off and there's not really a hell out of a linear story as I could see in this particular opera. Though I have to say that the ride from beginning to end was quite interesting to say the least. Now going into this particular production, since this is a production done by Peter Sellers, you'll pretty much expect a lot of the characters to interact with each other while dealing with the psychology of certain scenes and dealing with it in such a minimalistic fashion, which was pretty well done considering that the characters are all in one huge hospital or some type of mental health institution to show that they're not really well in the head. I'm sure that what he is trying to portray in this particular production is that the characters are people that you do not really want to meet on a daily basis. They're pretty much sick in the head and they just seemed kind of twisted. So you probably might end up just keeping distance from these said characters if you don't want to find out what lies beneath them. So overall, I really find this particular production of Le Grand Macabre to be quite well done in its own fashion, considering the fact that we see all of these characters in lab coats, and we even see 
televisions behind them depicting of what is going on in the world, what has been going on in the world, whether it be nuclear war or all of these type of political debates and political strifes, one can definitely tell that there is a sense of realism in this particular production, even though it is a surrealist opera. Now we get to the singers, starting off with Pete the Pot, sung by the superb character tenor, Peter Hoar. Now, Pete the Pot really does require a character tenor who not only has to sing all of his lines, but he also has to act. Character tenors who have sung Pete the Pot have also specialized in roles like Mima from the Ring to Trilogy, the Captain from Votsek, a lot of the character tenor roles in Lulu, Spallanzani from Tales of Hoffman, and a lot of other roles for a great character tenor. And Peter Hoare was a tenor I've heard a lot about, but I've never heard his voice live. But it's safe to say that the repertoire he specializes in is mainly character tenor parts. And from what I can tell from his voice, it is a very fine instrument. It's quite well tuned throughout all the registers. And he has great theatricality, which is a must in any character tenor. Sure, there are times that not a lot of people will like the sound of his voice. But to me, his execution, his theatricality, and the way he was able to produce such well-focused tones was an accomplishment. And I just have to give him a lot of kudos for just throwing himself into this particular role. And he just did a very fine job all throughout. Singing the role of Nekrozar was the fine Helden Baritone slash bass baritone Pablo Junca. Now, from what I can tell from this particular role, this does require either a dramatic baritone, a bass baritone, a Helden baritone, or even a high basso. It's not really like a Verdi baritone role where there are some high notes to be found. His tessitura mainly lies within the middle to the lower range. And for singers who have sung Nekrozar, they have also flocked to sing roles like Johanna Ann, Klingsor, Albrecht, Wotan, and a lot of these other great and superb Heldin baritone and bass baritone parts. I mainly know Pablo Junca by name and repertoire, as he seems to specialize in a huge length and width of bass baritone and held in baritone roles. From the held in baritone roles of Don Pizarro to the bass baritone roles of Bluebeard from Duke Bluebeard's Castle. And I have to say that he was in absolute tip top shape in terms of the way he sang. And he was a really fine actor, really making Necrozar quite cynical, but at the same time, quite imposing as a character. And his chemistry with Peter Hoare's Pete the Pot was really, really riveting. You really root for these two when they are bickering and you just want to see a lot of moments of strife, which I pretty much felt between these two characters. They definitely had a ball playing their particular characters and I could definitely see it. But more than anything, Pablo Junca was a very wonderful bass baritone who I really have to see a lot more of. Then we go to the two lovers, Amando and Amanda, known alternately as Spermando and Clitoria, sung by the superb contralto Ronita Miller and the very wonderful lyric soprano Ana Prohaska. Now, these two really do require a lot of fine singing. From Amando's part, he does need either a lyric mezzo or a mezzo contralto voice. And from Amanda's part, she needs a light lyric soprano voice. Interestingly enough, the first singers of Amando and Amanda were Kerstin Meyer and Elisabeth Söderström, respectively. Both of them were not only very well-known opera singers in their hometown of Sweden, but they have basically been well-known throughout all of Europe and the Americas. And in terms of Amando's vocal lines, he really does need a firm and steady mezzo-soprano or mezzo-contralto voice. 
thus making him a very fine singer for a lot of these low notes. And whether he be a dramatic mezzo, usually specializing in roles like Amneris or Eboli, or a mezzo contralto, specializing in roles like Anina from Rosencavalier, or even that of the first mate and Valtrauta from Elektra and Goethe Demeron, respectively, you really do need a fine singing actress to embody this role. And in terms of Amanda, she's quite the opposite. She needs a lyric soprano who has to sing very gracefully, and she has to have a lot of great musicianship. Singers who have sung Pamina, Nayade, Yvette from La Rondine, Sophie from Rosencavalier, and even to some extent Susanna and Gerbino from Nozze di Figaro have pretty much flocked to sing this particular role. And this has some really fine and lyrical lines which is quite accessible for any soprano singing Amanda. My impression of Ronita Miller's and Ana Prohaska's portrayals as the lovers was I thought that they were vocally secure as they have always been and I really appreciate them so much as singers. They were really excellent in their musicality and they had really sturdy and commanding stage presences. But more than anything, the major assets that these two awesome singers have are their insurmountable vocal resources. Now, in terms of what I thought of Ronita Miller singing the role of Amando, I thought she had a very sturdy sound, which is also thanks to that really awesome contralto voice. So if you ask me, I'm more accustomed to seeing Madame Miller in roles like Valtrauta and Anna from Goethe Demeron and Le Toyon respectively. The big sister slash motherly types of opera characters. Seeing her play a man was kind of bizarre for me, but she still managed to be a very fine actress and on top of that, a very wonderful singer from beginning to end. And in terms of Ana Prohaska's portrayal of Amanda, what more can I say about this awesome, awesome soprano? She gives it her all and she really knows how to shade her voice in such a lovely manner that I was so captivated by her portrayal as Amanda. So I'm not gonna mince words here. Ronita Miller and Anna Prohaska did a very excellent job as the lovers. Anthony Roth Costanzo's Prince Gogo was quite hilarious, but at the same time, it does show a great sense of him growing up and really encountering puberty because the character is supposed to be childlike and pretty much a child himself. Interestingly enough, the first singer to sing the role of Prince Gogo was actually a light coloratura soprano by the name of Gunilla Valen. She specialized in Olympia from Tales of Hoffman, Papagena from the Magic Flute, and a lot of these bright and breezy, light, soubrettish, coloratura soprano roles. And even though I do prefer a soubrettish, light soprano singing the role of Prince Gogo, I still have to give loads of credit to Anthony Roth Costanzo for bringing this character to life and making him quite noble, but at the same time, not making him a big spoiled brat. He was able to make Prince Gogo quite mature for his age, but at the same time, he still remembers that Prince Gogo is practically a kid in a man's body. And he was able to portray that really, really well. And his natural speaking voice was quite adorable too, especially considering that this opera is also a Zingspiel. You know, like you have not only song, but also some dialogue occurring between the characters. So I'm not gonna mince words here. Anthony Roth Costanzo was not only a very fine musician with a great focused tone, thanks to his superb countertenor voice, but he was a very fine actor as he managed to bring a little bit of humanity in what is otherwise a bratty character by the name of Prince Gogo. And I give him loads and loads of kudos for his great efforts. Then we go to Audrey Luna singing the dual roles of 
the goddess Venus, and Chief Gapopo. In terms of these two roles, they really need a flexible, high-singing, lyric colorateur soprano. Any soprano who has sung the likes of Blonde from Entführung aus dem Sereil, Aubin from Les Huguenots, Olympia from Tales of Hoffman, Pamina, Papagena, and the Queen of the Night from The Magic Flute, Celia and Junia from Lucio Silla, Aspasia and Ismene from Mitridate, Gilda from Rioletto, Oscar from Ballo in Maschera, Musetta from La Boheme, Lisette from La Rondine, Serbinetta from Ariadne of Naxos, Zdenka and Fiacrimili from Arabella, and a lot of these great roles for a lyric colorateur soprano also flock to sing this particular role. The first singer to sing Chief Capopo and Venus was Brit Marie Aron, who I've mainly encountered in her portrayal as the First Lady from Ingmar Bergman's film version of The Magic Flute, and I've also caught a few clips of the soprano on YouTube singing arias like the Jewel Song and even some snippets of her singing Lucio Silla as Lucio Cinna. And she has a very, very gorgeous voice. And what did I think of Audrey Luna? I have been wanting to see and hear this particular coloratura soprano live for quite some time. My first experience with Madame Luna was her interpretation of the Queen of the Night as she sang both of her arias, O Nicht and Der Hölle Rache, and also her rendition of Lachme's Bell Song and Lucia's Mad Scene, which I thought she sang everything really, really well. And I knew that this was a soprano I was going to look out for sometime in the future. And thank goodness I managed to get my wish. First of all, she has a very gorgeous timbre. And I really love that scintillating approach that she has to each of her characters, whether it be Venus or Gepopo. And she has a very, very scintillatingly gorgeous technique. She hits all of her high notes with clarity and charm. And she just has a very silvery texture to her voice, which is something I am so addicted to. She really has a very firm and equally gorgeous vocal presence. And for someone who's been singing roles like the Queen of the Night, Lucia, Gilda, Juliette, Blonde, Cervinetta, Gretel, and a lot of these other great coloratura soprano roles, I would really love to hear a lot more from Madame Luna in the near future. And I really hope that she also performs at the Deutsche Oper, Staatsoper Theater, and even at the Komische Oper Berlin. Because this is a soprano I would really, really love to look out for more often. Singing the role of Astradamors was the veteran basso profondo Frodo Olsen. Now what you really need in this particular character is not only a fine basso cantante and basso profondo, but you also need a very fine actor. Let's not forget that this gentleman has been browbeaten by Mescalina for quite some time, so it's hard not to make this guy feel a little bit more on the sympathetic side. Even though a lot of singers have sung the role of Hagen, Hunding, and a lot of these dark and heavy basso roles, they managed to also flock to this particular role because there is a great sense of character to be found. And luckily, what I found with Frode Olsen, even though I've mainly heard him by name, was a great voice. I really love the extension that he has on the lower notes as they sounded really, really full. And coming from a gentleman who specialized in roles like Zarastro and King Marke, it's really saying something when his voice was just so wonderful to listen to. And his stage presence was really, really great as he had a very fine stage presence, but more than anything, his vocal assets were at their absolute prime, even though he has been singing for many, many years. Heidi Melton was quite domineering as Mescalina. And interestingly enough, Mescalina has mainly been written for a mezzo-soprano or even that of a contralto. And mezzos who have sung the roles of the witch from Hensel and Gretel, both Giovanna and Madalena, 
from Rigoletto, Azucena, from Trovatore, Ulrica, from Ballo in Maschera, Mistress Quickly and Meg Page from Falstaff, La Zia Principessa, La Manitora e La Valessa from Suor Angelica, Frugola, from Il Tavaro, Zitta, from Gianni Schicchi, and a lot of these other great mezzo or contralto roles have also sung Mescalina. The one name that comes into my mind who has also specialized in this role was the Dutch contralto Jag van Ness, as I remembered reading somewhere in terms of one of my opera books that she also sang this particular role. From what I can tell from Heidi Melton's portrayal of Mescalina, I thought she was able to do a very, very fine job. And even though I mainly know Heidi Melton as a great Wagnerian soprano, I still have to give her loads of credit for really embodying this role with a great amount of strength, but also a great amount of just making this character as witchy as possible, which she was able to pull off really, really well. She did a very, very fine job as Mescalina, that there were times I was kind of terrified of her, but at the same time, I was quite intrigued of her in terms of how she was able to present herself on stage. And Heidi Melton was just absolutely fabulous in this particular role. She was a great actress, and she was just able to have a lot of fun with this particular character. And there was also a lot of great singing from a lot of the smaller roles, especially Joshua Blooms and Peter Tancit's great interpretation of the two ministers, which they sang with absolutely great comic timing. So overall, the star-studded cast of Giorgi Ligeti's Le Grand Macabre was just so superb. And the conducting done by Sir Simon Rattle was equally as excellent as everyone went together. So overall, I did not regret one single thing whatsoever. All of the singers were just fabulous. The production was quite interesting and everything seemed to go together wonderfully. And for those of you who saw this particular opera, what did you think of it? Did you love it? Did you feel like there was a singer who stood out to you so much? Or did you feel like there was something that just didn't hold up to you in your eyes? Comment below and let me know. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in next week for my review of Edward II at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. So until then, good night everybody.